Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam ala rasulih al-kareem. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our weekly session. Um, today we're looking at something slightly different, still looking at the um, arguments for the existence of God, existence of Allah. And here we'll be looking at um, one of the arguments which is most dominant within the Quran uh, regarding this particular matter. Now, this particular argument comes in various different forms. Even you'll find certain um, non-Muslim authors writing on the subject using a variety of different titles. And <clears throat> again, the argument is also very well known amongst uh, Muslim writings uh, by Muslim scholars. And as I said, it comes in various different forms. Some of the names that are used for this type of argument um, is, uh, for example, the argument uh, from creation, uh, the argument from invention, the prime mover argument, the kalam argument, the universal causation argument, the argument from first cause, the argument from the universe, or uh, the cosmological argument, and so on. Various different names have been given to this particular argument, and it all revolves around one central idea, which is that whatever comes into existence after having been non-existent, right? So again, this is important to remember. <clears throat> Sometimes the Muslims um, frame the argument in the wrong way. And then um, because of that, uh, they'll get criticized uh, by atheists that they've you know, not understood the argument. So the central idea is whatever comes into existence after having been non-existent must have a cause, right? That preferred its existence over its non-existence. Uh, we'll be <clears throat> giving you some examples of this later on. Again, the whole idea, it, compromise, uh, it comprises the idea that whatever is possible is most definitely contingent on a non-contingent cause that created it, that causes Allah. Now, don't get worried about terms like contingent and so on. In fact, if possible, depending on how things go on, next week we might look at a very specific argument, which is potentially one of the most powerful arguments uh, for the existence of Allah or the existence of God, uh, which is the contingency argument. So inshallah, we might look at that next week, uh, but don't get too frustrated because of the different terminologies are used, as long as you understand the central idea. And the central idea is whatever comes into existence. Now, this is important because sometimes they say, okay, but who created Allah? But that's an incorrect argument. Here, what we're saying is whatever comes into existence must have a cause. Whatever comes into existence must have a cause, right? That's the most important central idea that needs to be uh, understood. If you were to <coughs> put it in a, in a, in a prepositional uh, form, then the first proposition of the argument is that temporal events exist. A temporal event is that which was preceded by its non-existence or anything that has a beginning. So for example, you and I, we are temporal events or temporal beings. We didn't exist before you know, our parents, right? We came into existence. Before that, we were not existing. Uh, the, the room that you're possibly sitting in, right? There was a time when that room did not exist. Uh, the headset or the uh, monitor or the computer or the phone that you're currently holding. There was a time that that did not exist and it came into existence, right? So something which has a beginning. And then <clears throat> the second proposition is that temporal events point to the existence of a cause, right? There's always uh, a question that, okay, like, you know, if, if for example, you were, walking on a desert and you found a mobile phone naturally your thought would be there must have been someone who's been walking on this path before me who's most likely dropped their mobile phone here right 
at least some kind of explanation as to how this mobile phone came into existence at this particular place, right? No one walks past that desert and say, oh, this must have existed right from the beginning and uh, it must have formed over time on itself and it's always been here. No one does that even in real life. We always look at causal explanations. And then finally, the conclusion is temporal events in existence must have a cause. And we say that cause is Allah, right? That cause is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many uh, Muslim scholars have framed this argument in various ways. Uh, even Ibn Rushd, uh, he also gives, uh, he argues that this particular argument is based on two important uh, principles, right? Two important ideas uh, that uh, makes this argument clearly based on one's fitra. He calls it that it's part of the innate disposition of all people. And the first of these principles is that though these existing en entities are invented or created or came into existence, right? So everything from the uh, <clears throat> from the world of the plants, right? The fauna, uh, sorry, the flora and everything from the uh, types of different animals, they all came into existence, right? So that's the first uh, important principle. And the second principle is that every invented thing must have an inventor. Everything that is invented has an inventor. In other words, there's a cause. Something has brought it into existence, right? And so and what we see with the Quran and the way the Quran tries to address this is that what the Quran does is that many of the indicators of these tempor uh, temporal events are classified into two levels. There's two types of things which are have come into existence and are temporary. <laughs> now, there are some of them which are very close and easy to observe. And there are certain things which are remote, like not something which is obvious and easy to see. And, and, and so what the Quran normally does is it focuses on those temporal uh, emergence of individually observable creations. And I'll give an example of that. So you've got two types. That's in, in a very good nut. So let's say, for example, uh, the creation of man right, or the growing of a plant, or the growing of something like a tree. All of these things are visible, observable, right in front of us. It happens in front of us. There was a baby that was not born, and then suddenly the baby came into existence, right? And then there are certain other temporal things which are not observable right now by us. Like for example, let's say the emergence of the universe and how it all came into existence. We can't visually right now observe, observe all of those things. So what the Quran does, when we look at the nature of how the uh, Quran deals with this particular argument, we notice that it focuses on the first level because it is perceptible by the senses. We can see it, we can observe it, we can see how things are happening. And that's the obvious way to do things because <laughs> that's something which is part of one's fitra, right? Part of one's innate disposition. They see these things happening in front of them and they recognize that there must be a creator. Rather than going into deep philosophical arguments to try and prove, for example, the existence or the beginning of the universe and so on, the Quran primarily focuses on those matters which are immediately observable, right? This is a point that even uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmallah, uh, mentions, that the method mentioned in the Quran is by reasoning for the temporality of man and other beings, as in our, uh, us as individual human beings itself and our uh, temporality. There was a time we didn't exist, now we come into existence. And he says that whose temporality is known by observation and similar means. We see it in front of us. We see someone, you know, as I said, someone passing away, someone dying, um, you know, someone 
who is not uh, who is present is no longer present you know um, i'm sure many of you might have known recently uh, we were grieved with the death of our uh, beloved brother sheikh muhammad sharif uh, rahimahullah who passed away just recently you know he was someone that who was with us and now is no longer uh, with us in the same state and so uh, the Quran focuses on things which are easily observable and can easily demonstrate the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one who is, because we notice that if we see human beings and it can clearly then be argued that human beings have obviously come into existence and the cause of that existence ultimately goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to spend too much time on, on this particular point, but as you will be clear, when you look at the Quran, you know, the Quran presents various types of arguments. One of the key arguments, which we've discussed um, previously uh, quite a while ago, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am Am khaliqun. Am samawati wal ard, bal la yuqinun. The main one, Am Khuliqu Min Ghayli Shayin, were they created by nothing? Am Humul Khaliqun, or are they their own creators? Now, <clears throat> immediately, uh, we know the answer to both of those things by our fitrah, right? Naturally, we say we can't have been created by nothing. And again, it's a far more detailed argument, which if we have some time, we might discuss at some future time. But this idea that we, we ought to automatically, human beings would understand that there's a problem with that argument to say that we were created by nothing. And likewise, it's also problematic to say that we are the, our own creators, as in we ourselves gave birth to ourselves. Right, that's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. In the same way as it is ridiculous to say that we were created from nothing, and that's why when you look at the Quran, the Quran focuses on some of these temporal things and how they emerge, like the flowers, as we mentioned, and the animals, and the metals, and the rains, and the clouds. That's why there's a constant mention of these temporal things within the Quran telling us to observe them immediately with our, with our minds and with our sight in order to recognize it, uh, instinctively in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, when it comes to human beings, right, it was a seminal fluid it, it, I, that, that caused our existence. And in the same way, when it comes to fruits from trees and flowers on the earth and so on, these are all sensory things which we can see its emergence and, and it occurs in front of us. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do such people not remember that we created them before when they were nothing? And he also says, and the angel replied, so will it be, your Lord says, it is easy for me, just I created you before when you were nothing. <clears throat> so we were nothing, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us into existence. And that's why uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said that this is why the fitrah, our natural disposition, right, our innate nature, of the creation is wired so that whenever they see a newly emerging event, such like as a thunder, a lightning, an earthquake, what do they do? They automatically remember Allah. They glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they know that this occurrence did not happen by itself, but rather there was an originator who caused it to originate. There was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brought this event to happen and <clears throat> everyone knows that man was not created by himself his parents or anyone else from humankind everyone knows that he must have had an originator everyone knows he must have had a creator that created him and he is present alive omniscient omnip omnipotent all hearing and all seeing and the one who creates other living things is worthy of being alive than the one who and the one who grants other things knowledge is worthier of knowledge and the one who makes other things powerful is worthy worthier of power it is also known that the masterful design therein denotes the knowledge of the doer the designer right so when you look at the quran 
this is how it presents the arguments with the aim of the Quran uh, revealing the temporal nature of events and demonstrating a, a wider point. Not just, and again, this is a very important point, that Quran doesn't just focus on proving the existence of Allah. Normally, when the Quran presents these kind of evidences, just like the two verses that we uh, presented previously, it wants to actually prove another point. And if you look at, for example, <coughs> the verses I quoted to you just uh, earlier, the context of these verses show that they were revealed to offer reasoning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the most powerful and the most perfect in his power. And that more importantly, the lesson here was that he is able to bring about the resurrection. That once we are dead and buried and our bodies will decay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is capable of resurrecting us again. And the proof of that is that we were nothing before and Allah gave us life. Right. So that's actually even more difficult when you come when you're nothing and you're brought into existence, whilst now there are some remains and you are resurrected again. So, in other words, the one who created things out of nothing is a for theory able to refashion them. Right. And this amount is mentioned implicitly uh, whenever the Quran discusses these kind of matters, like the ayah that we just mentioned, or were they created by nothing, or they are their own creators. So in this powerful ayah of the Quran, the Quran gives you the greatest um, argument to demonstrate that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brought us into existence. We were nothing, and we could not have been created from nothing, nor are we the creators of ourselves. And nor were the uh, heavens, uh, nor did um, the heavens and the earth create everything. It is only going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the, the heavens and the earth can't be the creators because they're also contingent temporal beings they also came into existence and therefore it refers back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now there's a lot more to say about this particular argument um, and I'm not going to try and um, go go through all of the points um, and so just to kind of finalize and summarize the points when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says were they created by nothing or are they their own creators the verse starts off by setting out the great theological reality, reality by focusing the discussion to what are the possibilities. In other words, when you go through this ayah, <clears throat> we're looking at how did we come into existence? And we're looking at all of the possible explanations. One explanation could be we created, we were created from nothing. Uh, as in we, from nothing comes nothing, right? But we are something. But to say that we were created just from nothing doesn't give a proper explanation. To say that we created ourselves also doesn't provide a reasonable explanation. And therefore, by going through these different possibilities, we are ultimately led with the one true option, which is that man has a creator who created him and her. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brought us into existence. And the verse obviously poses the question, were they brought into existence without anyone causing it? Or did they bring themselves into existence? It is neither, for it is Allah who created them and gave them life, having previously been nothing worth mentioning. And again, this ayah, when, when this ayah was recited, um, Jubair ibn Mut'im, uh, he said that I heard the Prophet Sallam read Surah Tur in the Maghrib prayer. And when he reached this verse, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun or were they created by nothing, or are they their own creators? He said, my heart almost flew out. Because anyone who contemplates on, the, on this particular argument, it's an extremely powerful argument. Uh, and this was the methods of the prophets in debating those who denied the lordship of Allah and claimed it for themselves. 
and, and this is how the prophets instructed them with rational arguments to demonstrate the lordship, lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by demonstrating that he is the one who actually created us. So when we look at the argument, the argument uh, is uh, the one I previously presented has this particular form. Temporary events, temporal events exist. You and I example is an example of that. A table, a chair, all are temporal events. And a temporal event is that which was preceded by its non-existence. It didn't exist and then it came into existence or that it had a beginning. Second proposition, <laughs> temporal events point to the existence of a cause, right? There has to be a cause for something that was not existent and now suddenly existing, there has to be a cause. And finally, the conclusion is that that cause must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, similar to that, um, and I won't go into details today because there would be a lot more to say on this, is the cosmological argument that um, normally is used uh, by uh, many of the philosophers and scholars of Kalam and so on. And that uh, goes by this fo uh, following route uh, or following propositions. The first proposition is that anything with a beginning must have a cause. Anything with a beginning must have a cause. The second proposition is that the universe has a beginning. Now, just one point to realize is that in the past, this was uh, obviously disputed. Many of the Greek philosophers and others were actually of the view that the universe has always existed, right? And so therefore, again, if we were to break down this argument a lot more, then we could go through all of the different points because now then we're talking about, uh, you know, pre-eternity versus temporality and so on. Um, but we don't need to do that today. Uh, and then the second preposition. So the second preposition is the one which is normally disputed. The universe has a beginning. Uh, but nowadays we know through all of the, uh, even the latest images that we've just got um, from the outer space uh, demonstrates that the universe had a beginning. And therefore the conclusion is that the universe must have a cause and the cause that preferred its existence over its non-existence is Allah. So this is one of the arguments that have been developed. There are several others um, that goes into uh, a much more detailed discussion um, explaining the existence of Allah. But today I'll just go through this one and inshallah, I think we'll end here. So if you have any questions or queries, Inshallah, we can address them before we finish the session.